Chapter One of Joan Thursday by Lewis Joseph Vance. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter One. She stood on the southeast corner of Broadway at Twenty Second Street, waiting for a northbound car with a vacant seat she had been on her feet all day and was very tired so tired that the prospect of being obliged to stand all the way uptown seemed quite intolerable and so though quick with impatience to get home and have it over with she chose to wait up out of the south from lower broadway and the sweatshop perlouse of union square defiled an unending procession of surface cars without exception dark with massed humanity pausing momentarily before the corner where the girl was waiting as if mockingly submitting themselves to the appraisal of her alert eyes one after another received the signal of the switchman beyond the northern crossing and ground sluggishly on not one but was crowded to the guards affording the girl no excuse for leaving her position she waited on her growing impatience as imperceptible as her fatigue neither of them discernible to those many transient stares which she received with a semblance of blank indifference that was in reality not devoid of consciousness youth will not be overlooked reinforced by an abounding vitality such as hers it becomes imperious this girl was as pretty as she was poor and as young judged by her appearance she might have been anywhere between sixteen and twenty years of age she was in fact something over eighteen and at heart more nearly a child than this age might be taken to imply more a child than any who knew her suspected she herself suspected it least of all she looked what she liked to believe herself a young woman of considerable experience with life simple and even cheap her garments still owned a certain distinction which she would without hesitation have termed stylish a quality of smartness which somehow contrived not incongruously to associate with inferior materials her shirt-waist was of opaque linen pleated and while not laundry fresh was still presentable her skirt fitted her hips snugly and fell in graceful lines to a point something short of her low tan shoes showing stockings of a texture at once coarse and sheer to her hat an ordinary straw simply trimmed with a band and a show of ribbon she had lent some little factitious character by deftly twisting it a trifle out of the prevailing shape over one arm she carried a coat of the same material as her skirt and in her hand a well-worn handbag of imitation leather rather too large and decorated with a monogram of two initials in german silver the initials were j t her name was joan thursby uniform with a thousand sisters of the shop counters she was yet mysteriously different men looked twice in passing after passing some turned to look again her face tinted by the glow of the western sky was by no means poor in native colour a shade thin its regular features held a promise vague fugitive and provoking her hair was a brown which hardly escaped being ruddy and her skin matched it lacking alike the dusky warmth of the broom and the purity of the blonde she was neither tall nor short but seemed misleadingly smaller than she was in fact thanks to the slightness of a body more stupidly nourished than undernourished or immature her eyes were brown and large and they were very beautiful indeed when divorced from the vacancy of weary thinking it was only in this look of the unthinking toiler that unconsciously she confessed her immense fatigue her features were relaxed into lines and contours of apathy she seemed neither to think nor even to be capable of much sustained thought yet she was thinking and that very intensely if unconsciously her mind was not only active but was one of considerable latent capacity something which she did not in the least suspect 
indeed it had never occurred to joan to debate her mental limitations her thoughts were as a rule more emotional than psychical as now when she was intensely preoccupied with pondering how she was to explain at home the loss of her position and what would be said to her and how she would feel when all had been said and what she would then do daylight was slowly fading though it was only half after six of an evening in june the sun was already invisible smudged out by a portentous bank of purplish cloud whose profile was edged with fire of gold against a sky of tarnished blue a sky that seemed dimmed with the sweat of day-long heat and toil the city air was close and moveless and the cloud bank was lifting very slowly from behind the jersey hills it might be several hours before the promised storm would break and bring relief to a parched and weary people at length despairing of her desire the girl moved out to the middle of the street and boarded the next open car of the lexington avenue line she was able to find standing room only between two seats toward the rear where smoking was permitted she stood just inside the running board grasping the back of the forward seat her hand rested between the shoulders of two men she was the only woman in that section behind her were ten masculine knees in a row before her five masculine heads ten men crowding the two transverse benches some smoking all stolidly absorbed in newspapers and indifferent to the intrusion of a woman none dreamed of offering the girl a seat nor did she find this anything remarkable in whom use had bred the habit of accepting without question such everyday phenomena if she was weary so were the men if she desired the consideration due her sex then must she enfranchise herself from the sexless struggle for a living wage the car swerving into twenty-third street plunged on to and turned north on lexington avenue thereafter its progress consisted of a series of frantic leaps from street corner to street corner when it was in motion there was a grateful rush of air when it paused the heat was stifling and the fumes of cigarettes pipes and cheap cigars blended to manufacture a mephitic reek a slight sweat dewed the face of the girl and her colour faded to pallor her feet and legs were aching her back ached with much lifting of boxes to and from shelves her head ached chiefly because of the inevitable malnutrition of a shop-girl's lunch from time to time more passengers were taken on a lesser number alighted joan found herself obliged to edge farther in between the rank of knees and the rigid back of the forward seat by the time the car crossed forty-second street she was at the inside guard-rail ten persons half of them standing were occupying a space meant for five it was then or only a trifle later that she became conscious of the knee which the man behind her was purposely pressing against her then for a minute or two she was let alone but she was sick with apprehension she stood it as long as she could then abruptly she twisted round and faced her persecutor before her eyes half blinded by rage and disgust his face swam like the mask of an incubus a blur of red flesh fixed in an insolent smirk she was dimly aware of curious glances lifting to the sound of her tremulous voice must i leave this car or will you let me alone there was a pause of an instant then she had her answer in a tone of truculent contempt ah what's the matter with you anyhow she choked stammering and looked round in despair but the man at her elbow was grinning with open amusement and another seated beside her tormentor was pretending to notice nothing his nose buried in a newspaper if you don't like the going sister why don't you get off and walk this from him who had compelled that frantic protest with a lurch the car stopped and as it did so the girl turned impulsively grasped the guard-rail swung her lithe body between it and the floor of the car and dropped to the cobbles between the tracks she staggered a foot or two away 
followed by an indistinguishable taunt amid derisive laughter fortunately there was no car bearing down on the southbound track to endanger her while that which she had left flung away as recovering she ran to the sidewalk she began to trudge northward the first street lamp she encountered told her she had alighted at forty-seventh street and had another mile and a half to walk but with all her weariness she no longer thought of riding it was impossible she could never escape annoyance men just wouldn't let her alone men shuddering imperceptibly her eyes hot with tears of shame and indignation she walked rapidly anxious to gain the refuge of her home to be secure for a time at least from man they called themselves men she despised them all all beasts what had she ever done it wasn't as if this was the first time they were always plaguing her hardly a day passed well anyway never a week it wasn't her fault if she was pretty she never even so much as looked at them but they kept on staring nudging she didn't believe there was a decent fellow living except of course that one he was different at least he had been somehow like a perfect gentleman he had come between her and a gang of tormentors had knocked one down and thrown the rest into confusion with a lively play of fists and then whisking joan into a convenient taxicab had taken her to the corner nearest her home never so much as asking her name or if he might call she had expected him too like in a book but he didn't nor had he likewise contrary to her expectations at any time thereafter been known to haunt her neighbourhood to her the affair was like a dream of chivalry she remembered him as very handsome probably far more handsome than he really was and different with grand clothes and manners the man had helped her out of the cab and lifted his hat in parting all in all vastly unlike any of the fellows whose rude attentions she somewhat loftily permitted in the streets after supper or at the home of some other girl that one remained her dream lord of romance and in her heart of hearts she was sure that some day their paths would cross again but it had all happened so long ago that she had grown a little faint with waiting so smothering her indignation with roseate fancies she plodded her weary way to seventy-sixth street where turning eastward she presently ascended a squat brownstone stoop entered the dingy vestibule of a dingier tenement pressed the button below a mailbox labelled thursby waited till the latch clicked its spasmodic welcome and then began her weary climb to the topmost floor End of chapter one chapter two of joan thursday by lewis joseph vance this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Ferrard. the five flights of steps were long and steep and covered with a compound of fabric grease and dirt which to-day resembling a thin layer of decayed rubber had once been bright linoleum there was no light other than a dejected dusk filtering down the wall from a grimy skylight in the roof a twilight lacking little of the gloom of night on each landing five doors opened three toward the back two toward the front of the building most of them ajar for purposes of ventilation and publicity it was a question which was the louder the clatter of tongues or the conflict of odours from things cooking and things that would doubtless have been the better for purification by fire at the top conditions were a little more endurable and when joan had shut behind her the door giving access to her home the clatter and squalling came from below a familiar and not unpleasant blend of dissonances and within the smells were individual chiefly of boiled cabbage and fried pork with a feebly contending flavour of cheap tobacco smoke she was in the dining-room of the thursby flat behind it lay the kitchen 
forward three small cubicles successively denominated on the architect's plans as bedchamber alcove and parlor they were all however sleeping rooms the nearest was occupied by joan's brother the next the alcove contained a double bed dedicated to joan and her young sister while the parlor held a curiosity called a folding bed which had long since ceased to fold and on which slept anthony thursby and his wife mrs thursby was now in the kitchen preparing dinner with the assistance of her fifteen-year-old daughter edna butch the son of the house was not at home anthony thursby sat at the dining-table head bent over a ragged notebook and a well-thumbed collection of white and pink newspaper clippings it was the sight of him that checked joan in her explicit intention she had meant to enter dramatically to her mother blurt out the news with the cause of her misfortune and abandon herself to the luxury of self-pity soothed by sympathy but she had also meant to have it understood that nobody was to tell the old man at least not until she should have established herself in a new job in short she had not thought to find thursby at home hesitating beside the table she removed the long pins from her hat while she stared with narrowed eyes at her father she was wondering whether she hadn't better confess and have it out with him first as last the only thing indeed that made her pause was the knowledge that there would be no living with him until she was once more earning good money behind a counter and she was firmly determined not again to seek employment in a department store regarding fixedly the round but unpolished bald head with its neglected fringe of gray hair she asked herself if the bitterness in her heart for her father were in truth hatred or mere premonitory resentment of the opposition he would unquestionably set against her plans for the future he was a man of nearly fifty who looked more in spite of a tendency to genial corpulence at thirty he had been a fair and handsome man to-day his round red face was mottled disfigured by a ragged gray moustache discolored by several days growth of scrubby beard and lined and seamed with the imprint of that consuming passion whose sign was also set in his gray passionate haunted eyes shabbily dressed in a soiled madras shirt and shoddy trousers he wore neither tie nor collar his unkempt chin hung in folds upon his chest fat and grimy forearms protruded from his rolled-up sleeves fat and mottled hands trembled slightly but perceptibly as they rustled the pink and white clippings and with a stubby pencil scrawled mysterious hieroglyphics in the battered notebook thursby was intent upon what he and indeed all his family knew as his dope checking and rechecking selections for tomorrow's races this pursuit with its concomitants its attendant tides of hope and disappointment was his infatuation at once the solace and the terror of his declining years now and again he muttered unintelligibly there rose a sound of voices in the kitchen annoyed by the interruption he started looked up and discovered joan she offered to his irritated gaze a face of calm with unsmiling features hello he growled how the how long have you been in only a few minutes pa the girl returned quietly well what are you standing there staring for anyhow i didn't mean anything i was just taking off my hat well his face was now purple with senseless anger cut along don't bother me i'm busy i see there was a damnable superciliousness in the tone of the girl as she turned away thursby meditated an explosion but refrained at discretion joan had taught him that unlike her brow-beaten mother and timid sister and her sleek loaferish brother she could give as good as he could send he bent again grumbling over his dope instantly it gripped him obliterating all else in his cosmos he frowned moistened the pencil at his mouth and scrawled another note in the greasy little book joan slipped quietly away to her bedroom she found it stifling 
ventilated solely from the parlor and the open door to butch's kennel it reeked with the smell of human flesh and cheap perfume she noted resentfully the fact that her sister had neglected to make up the bed its rumpled sheets and pillows still retaining the impression of overnight lent the cubicle the final effect of sordid poverty hanging up her hat and coat she sat for a time on the edge of the bed thinking profoundly such an existence she felt past human endurance and a gate of escape stood ajar to her with a mundane paradise beyond if only she had the courage to adventure in any event conditions as they were now with the thursbys could not obtain much longer if the old man continued to follow the races through the pool rooms he would soon be forced out of his small business and his family dispossessed of their mean lodgings and there was no longer any excuse for hope that he would ever shake off the bondage of his infatuation as it was he gave little enough toward the support of his family and grudged that little almost all his meagre profits went to the pool rooms it was only when he won or seldom otherwise that he would spare his wife a few dollars furthermore his business was heavily involved in an intricate meshing of debt thursby at least persisted in calling it a business though joan's lips shaped scornfully at mention of that mean and insignificant newspaper shop crowded in between a saloon and a delicatessen shop in the shadow of the third avenue elevated railway in her understanding it was chiefly remarkable as the one place where one could be certain of not finding thursby during the afternoon or butch at night they were seldom there together it was as if father and son could not breathe the same atmosphere for long at a time nominally butch was his father's assistant actually he alone kept the business alive had it not been for his supervision of the morning and evening paper deliveries it would long since have wasted inconspicuously away by way of compensation butch shrewdly alive to signs of a winning day would now and again wheedle a dollar or two out of the old man wages he neither received nor expected being well content with a nominal employment which served to cover many an hour of unlicensed liberty and he seemed to have access to some mysterious if occasionally scanty fund for he was never without some little money in pocket after dinner if butch elected to eat the evening meal at home he invariably disappeared and his return was a matter of his personal convenience he had been known not to sleep at home at all his favorite bedtime was between one and two in the morning after the saloons had closed yet no one had ever seen him drunk he was younger than joan by a year born to the name of edgar he had been dubbed butch in the public schools and the name had stuck even his mother and father employed it and yet it could not be said to suit him rather the boy suggested a jockey he was short slender and wiry with a strong emaciated nose flanked by small eyes sunk deep in sallow cheeks his mouth set in a perpetually sardonic curve he dressed neatly whatever the straits and necessities of the family to the mitigation of which he contributed nothing whatever and had a failing for narrow red neckties and flashy waistcoats his hard thin lips were generally tight upon a cigarette they were forever tight upon his personal affairs if he opened them at home it was to kid the girls which he did with a slangy mordant wit or to drop some casually affectionate word to his mother his conversation with his father whom he seemed always to be watching with a narrow grim suspicion was ordinarily confined to monosyllables of affirmation or negation he went his secret ways self-sufficient wary reserved a perpetual subject of covert speculation to the women of his family joan had heard it whispered that he was a member of the car barn gang but she never dared question butch though she trembled every time she came upon newspaper headlines advertising some fresh hooliganism on the part of the gang a policeman beaten up a sober citizen held up and frisked in the small hours or a member of some rival organization 
found stabbed and weltering on the sawdust floor of a grisly dive between this girl and her brother there existed a strange harmony of understanding quite tacit and almost unrecognized by either joan's nearest approach to acknowledgment of it resided in infrequent admissions to friends that she could get on with butch whereas the rest of the bunch made her weary almost all the vigor and vitality of the mother seemed to have been surrendered to butch and joan there had been little left for edna the girl was frail anemic flat-chested pretty in an appealing way fit only for one of two things tuberculosis or reconstruction in the country as it was in the busy seasons she found underpaid employment in the workrooms of sixth avenue dressmaking establishments between whiles she drudged at housework to the limits of her small strength as for mrs thursby it was singularly difficult for joan to realize her mother there was about the woman something formless and intangible she seemed to fail to make a definite impression even upon the retina of the physical eye she had the faculty of effacing herself seemed more a woman that had been than a woman who was the four boundary walls of the flat comprehended her existence she seldom left the house she never changed her dress save for bed it might have been thought that she would thus dominate her world to the contrary she haunted it more a wraith than a body a creature of functions rather than of faculties she had a way of being in a room without attracting a glance of passing through and from it without leaving an impression of her transit when joan made herself look directly at her mother she was able to detect traces of ravaged beauty a living shell in which its tenant lay dormant her subjective will to live alone kept this woman going her sempiternal rounds of monotony capacity for affection she apparently had none she regarded her children with as little interest as her husband nor had she the power to excite or sustain affection joan believed she loved her mother she did not she accepted her as a convention in which affection inhered through tradition alone seated on the edge of the bed her face flushed with the heat of the smouldering evening sombre eyes staring steadfastly at the threadbare carpet the girl shook her head silently in dreary wonder she stood at crossroads she could of course go on as she had gone bartering youth and strength for a few dollars a week but every fibre of her being every instinct of her forlorn soul was in vital mutiny against such servitude in fact doubt no longer existed in joan's mind as to which way she would turn dread of the inevitable rupture alone deterred her from the first steps from the rear of the flat edna called her fretfully joan joan ain't you coming to eat joan rose she answered affirmatively in a strong voice her mind was now made up she would tell them after supper after the old man had gone back to the shop she posed before a mirror touching her hair with deft fingers while she stared curiously at the face falsified in the depths of the uneven sheet of glass then placing her hands on her hips at the belt line thumbs to the back she lifted her shoulders at one and the same time smoothing out the wrinkles in her waist and settling her belt into place oh she said as casually as if there had been any one to hear i guess i'll do all right all right End of chapter two chapter three of joan thursday by lewis joseph vance this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Berard. with a careless nod to her mother and sister joan slipped into her chair and helped herself mechanically but liberally to the remains of pork and cabbage her mother tilted a graniteware pot over a cup and filled the latter with a decoction which in the thursby menu masqueraded as coffee joan acknowledged the service with an outspoken thanks 
at this edna plucked up courage to say with some animation joan the mother interrupted with a sibilant warning hush thursby lifted his head and raked the three faces with an angry glance in god's name he cried can't you women hold your tongues the girls made their resentment variously visible joan with a scowl and a toss of her head edna with a timid pout the mother's face betrayed no emotion whatsoever thereafter as far as they were concerned the meal progressed in silence thursby bent low over his plate in the intervals devoted to mastication intently studying the file of dope at his elbow now and again he would drop knife and fork to take up his pencil and check the name of a horse or jot additional memoranda in his notebook infrequently he spoke or rather grunted to indicate a desire for some dish beyond his reach curiously enough joan remarked for the thousandth time he was punctilious to say please and thank you the idiosyncrasy was all a piece she thought with the ease with which he employed knife fork and spoon a careless grace which the girl considered elegant and did him the honour to imitate furtively throughout the meal she studied her father these little peculiarities of his these refinements which sat so strangely on his gross neglected person and were so exotic to his circumstances exerted a compelling fascination upon the nimble curiosity of the girl she both feared and despised him but none the less cherished a sneaking admiration for the man beyond the fact that their estate had not always been so sorry she knew nothing of the history of her parents but she liked to think of her father that he had once been in some unknown way superior that he was a man ruined by a marriage beneath his station to think this flattered her own secret dreams of rising out of her environment girls she had heard took after their fathers and vice versa perhaps she had inherited some of anthony thursby's keener intelligence adaptability and sensitiveness those qualities with which she chose to endow the man who had been thursby before he became her father other circumstances lent colour to this theory butch for instance had unquestionably inherited his mother's physique and her reticence while joan had her father's vigorous constitution and a body like his for sturdiness and good proportion suddenly thrusting back his chair thursby rose buttoned a soiled collar round his neck shrugged a shabby coat upon his shoulders and pocketing his dope departed with neither word nor glance for his womenfolk his heavy footsteps were pounding the second flight of steps before a voice broke the hush in the stuffy little room a voice faint and toneless dim and passionless it was mrs thursby's he's had a bad day i guess edna placed a tender hand over the scalded listless one that rested on the oilcloth joan abandoning her determination to air her personal grievances at the first available instant said suddenly never mind ma it ain't like he was a drinkin man the vacant eyes and the faded face of the mother were fathoming distances remote from the four walls of the slatternly room her thin and colourless lips trembled slightly little more than a whisper escaped them sometimes i wish he was wish he had been it'd have been easier to stand all this a faltering gesture indicated vaguely the misery of their environment edna continued to pet the unresponsive hand don't mother she pleaded the woman stirred withdrew her hand and slowly got up come on edna let's get done with them dishes with eyes hard and calculating joan watched the two drift into the kitchen their wretched state touched her less than the fact that she must continue forever to share it or else try to better it in open defiance of her father's prejudices something's got to be done for this family she grumbled and i don't see anybody even thinking of doing anything but me she rose and strode angrily back to the cubicle she shared with edna in a fit of unreasoning rage snatching her hat from its hook she impaled it upon her hair with hat-pins that stabbed viciously it had grown too dark to see more than a vague white shape moving on the surface of the mirror 
but she did not stop to light the gas to make sure she was armored against the public eye in another moment bag in hand coat over her arm she was letting herself out into the hallway time enough to-morrow morning to fret her mother and sister with news of her misfortune to-night she was in the humor to make a bold move toward freedom but on the doorstep she checked a trifle dashed by apprehension of the impending storm which she had quite forgotten she drew back into the vestibule she could hardly afford to subject her only decent waist and skirt to danger of a drenching an atmosphere if anything more dense than that of the day blanketed heavily the city even the gutter children seemed to feel its influence and instead of making the evening hideous with screams and rioting moved with an uncommon lethargy or stood or squatted apart in little groups their voices hushed and querulous the roar of the trains on the nearby elevated seemed muted the clangor of the third avenue surface cars blunted and joan fancied that the street lamps burned with an added lustre wayfarers moved slowly if near home otherwise briskly with a spirit as unwilling as unwanted one and all with frequent glances skyward overhead a low-hung bosom of dusky vapour borrowed a dull blush from the fires of life that blazed beneath in the west beyond the silhouetted structure of the elevated and the less distinct profile of buildings on the far side of central park the clouds blazed luridly with their own dread fires a fitful sheeted play athwart gigantic curtains to an accompaniment of dull and intermittent grumbles a soft warm breath sighed down the breathless street and sighing died another more cool and brusque swept sharp upon the heels of the first played with the littered rubbish of the pavements caressed with a grateful touch flesh still stinging with the heat of day and drove on preceded by a cloud of acrid dust a few drops of lukewarm water maculated the sidewalks with spots as big as dollars there followed a sharper play of fire and one more near children ran shrieking to shelter and men and women dodged into convenient doorways or scudded off clumsily the wind freshened grew more chill then so suddenly that there might as well have been no warning on the wings of the howling blast laced continually with empyrean fire timed by the rolling detonations of heavy artillery now near now far a shining deluge sluiced the streets and made its gutters brawling rivulets a lonely huddled figure standing back in the entry well out of the spray from the spattering drops joan waited the passing of the storm with neither fascination nor fear so absorbed her mood almost altogether introspective she weighed her reckless plans the crisis bellowed overhead in a series of tremendous shattering explosions bathing the empty street in wave after wave of blinding violet light without seriously disturbing the slow steady processes of the girl's mentality then she became aware of a young man who had emerged from the dark some backwards of the tenement so quietly that joan had no notion how long he might have been standing there regarding her with interest and amusement in his grey eyes and on his broad good-humoured countenance he had a long strong body for his solidly unsturdy legs short arms with large efficient hands and bore himself with a careless confidence that did much to dissemble the negligence of his mode of dress the ill-fitting coat and trousers the common striped outing shirt the rusty derby set a slant on his round close-cropped head joan knew him as ben austin one of the few admirers whose attentions she was wont to suffer by occupation a stage-hand at the hippodrome a steady young man who lived with his mother in one of the rear flats he greeted her with a broadening grin and a hello joan she said with indifference hello ben waitin for the rain to let up no foolish i'm posing for a statue of patience by a sculptor who's going to be born to-morrow this answer was brilliantly in accord with the humour of the day austin chuckled appreciatively i thought maybe you was waitin for jeems to bring around your limousine miss thursby i was 
but he won't be here till day before yesterday the strain of such repartee proved too much for austin he felt himself outclassed and shuffling to cover his discomfiture sought another subject what you doing tonight joan anything special i've got an engagement to pass remarks on the weather with the duke to bonehead the girl returned with asperity he ain't late either i guess that was one off the griddle all right said austin pensively excuse me for a living there fell a pause joan contemptuously staring away through the glimmering raindrops austin desperately casting about for a conversational opening less calculated than his predecessors to educe rebuffs say joan lesson move on the girl interrupted you're blocking the traffic not nah, serious how'd you like to go to a show tonight she turned incredulous eyes to him what show she drawled i got a pass for zigfeld's follies new york roof want to go what you're kidding she replied after a brief pause devoted to analysis of his sincerity you know you've got to work nothing like that he insisted they have closed last saturday and i got a couple of weeks layoff while they're getting ready to rehearse the new show on the level now will you go with me will i the girl drew a long ecstatic breath then her face darkened as she glanced again at the street but we'll get all wet no we won't i'll get an umbrella besides it's letting up with this austin vanished to return in a few minutes with a fairly presentable umbrella the shower was in fact fast passing on over long island leaving in its wake a slackening drizzle and amid deep-throated growls at constantly lengthening intervals half-clothed children were seeping in swelling streams from the tenements as the two austin holding the umbrella joan with a hand on her escort's arm her skirts gathered high about her trim ankles splashed through lukewarm puddles toward third avenue a faint and odorous vapor steamed up from wet and darkly lustrous asphalt they hurried on in silence austin dumbly content with his conquest of the aloof tolerance which the girl had theretofore shown him and planning bolder and more masterful steps joan all ecstatic with the prospect of seeing for the first time a broadway show a few minutes before nine they left the crosstown car at broadway and forty-second street though she had lived all her young years within the boundaries of new york never before had joan experienced the sensation of being a unit of that roaring flood of life which nightly scours long acre square with scarce a perceptible change in volume winter or summer yet she accepted it with apparently implacable calm she felt as if she had been born to this as if she were coming tardily into her birthright something of which each least detail would in time become most intimate to her they were already late and austin hurried her a brief hasty walk brought them to the theatre where austin left her in a corner of the lobby with a promise that he would return in a very few minutes he had to see a friend round back he explained in an undertone but joan remained a target for boldly inquiring glances for full ten minutes before he reappeared even then with a nod to her to wait austin went to the box-office window she was not deceived as to the general tenor of his fortunes there saw him place a card on the ledge and confer inaudibly with the ticket-seller and then reluctantly remove the card and substitute for it two one-dollar bills for which he received two slips of pasteboard house most sold out he muttered uncomfortably in her ear as an elevator carried them to the roof best i could get was table seats they're just as good as any she whispered with a look of gratitude that temporarily turned his head the elevator discharged them into a vast hall with walls and a roof of glass artificial wisteria festooned its beams and pillars of steel palms and potted plants lined the walls a myriad electric bulbs glimmered dimly throughout the auditorium brilliantly upon the small stage deep banks of chairs radiated back from the footlights to each its tenant staring greedily in one common direction an usher waved the newcomers to the left ultimately they found seats at 
a small table in a far corner of the enclosure austin was disappointed and made his disappointment known in a public grumble the table was too far away they couldn't see nothing might well not have come joan smiled his ill-humour away insisting that the seats were fine mollified he summoned a waiter and ordered beer for himself for joan a glass of lemonade a weirdly decorated and insipid concoction which nevertheless joan absorbed with the keenest relish in point of fact the distance from their seats to the stage offered little obstacle to her complete enjoyment her senses were all youthful and unimpaired she saw and heard what many another missed of those in their neighbourhood furthermore joan brought to an entertainment of this character a point of view fresh virginal and innocent of the very meaning of ennui she sat forward on the extreme edge of her chair imperceptibly a quiver with excitement avid of every sight and sound all that was tawdry vulgar and contemptible escaped her she was sensitive only to the illusion of splendour and magnificence and lived enraptured by dreamlike music exquisite wit and the poetic beauty of femininity but half clothed or less and viewed through a kaleidoscopic play of coloured light during the intermission she bent an elbow on the sloppy table-top and chattered at austin with a vivacity new in his knowledge of her and for which he had no match at one time during the second part of the performance the auditorium was suddenly darkened while attention was held to the stage by the antics of a pair of german comedians but in the shadows that now surrounded them quite unconscious that austin had seized this opportunity to capture her warm young hand joan became aware of a number of figures issuing from a side door to the stage she saw them marshalled in ranks of two a long double file vaguely glimmering through the obscurity and then the comedians darted into the wings the lights blazed out at full strength all over the enclosure and a roll of drums crescendo roused the audience to a tremendous and exhilarating novelty a procession of chorus girls in hip tights and hussar tunics who each with a snare drum at waist had stolen down the aisle into the heart of the auditorium for a long moment they marked time drumming skilfully their leader with her polished baton standing beside joan then the orchestra blared out an accompaniment and they strode away turning left and marching up the centre aisle to the stage john marked with pulses that seemed to beat in tune to the drumming the wistful beauty of many of the painted faces with their aloof eyes and fixed smiles of conscious self-possession the richness of their uniforms their bare powdered arms the pretty legs and their silken casings oblivious to the libidinous glances of the goggling men they passed she envied them one and all the meanest and homeliest of them even as the most proud and beautiful this chance of theirs to act to be admired to win the homage of the herd she awoke as from idyllic dreams to find herself again in a third avenue car homeward bound but still her brain was drowsy with memories of the splendour and the glory fragments of haunting melody ran through her thoughts and visions haunted her of herself commanding a similar meed of adoration austin's arm lay along the top of the seat behind her his fingers rested lightly against the sleeve of her shirtwaist she did not notice them to his clumsily playful advances she returned indefinite monosyllabic answers accompanied by her charming smile of a grateful child on the third landing of their tenement they paused to say good night visible to one another only in a faint light reflected up from the gas jet burning low in the hall below the smell of humanity and its food hung in the clammy air they breathed a hum of voices from the many cells of the hive buzzed in their ears but joan forgot them all she hesitated embarrassed with the difficulty of finding words adequate to express her thanks austin tried awkwardly to help her out well i guess it's good night kid she said exclamatory oh ben i've had such a good time did you glad to hear it will you go again next week i guess i can work some other show all right compunction smote as memory reminded her but 
ben didn't you have to pay for those tickets oh that's all right i couldn't find the fellow i was looking for round back i'm so sorry gwan it wasn't nothing cheap at the price if you liked it little girl i liked it awfully but i won't go again unless you show me the pass first well we'll see about that he edged a pace nearer suddenly self-conscious joan drew back and offered her hand good night and thank you so much ben he took the hand but retained it ah say is this all i get i thought you kind of liked me i do ben but well a kiss won't cost you nothing it's your turn now but ben but ben oh well if that's the way you feel about it he made as if to relinquish her hand but to be thought lacking in generosity had stung her beyond endurance without stopping to think blindly and quickly so that she might not think she gave herself to his arms well she breathed in a soft voice just one just one eh he pressed his lips to hers oh i don't know about that he tightened his embrace her heart was hammering madly his mouth hurt her lips his beard rasped her tender skin she wanted frantically to get away to regain possession of herself and wanted it the more because dimly through the tumult of thought and emotion she was conscious of the fact that she rather liked it joan austin murmured in a tone that soft with the note of wooing was yet vibrant with the elation of the conqueror joan one arm shifted up from her waist and his big hand rested heavily over her heart for a breath she seemed numb and helpless suffocating with the tempest of her senses then like lightning there pierced her confusion the memory of the knee that had driven her from the car only that afternoon symbolic of the bedrock beastliness of man with a quick twist and wrench she freed herself and reeled a pace or two away ben she cried in a voice hoarse with anger you you brute why what's the matter what right had you to to touch me like that she panted retreating as he advanced he paused realizing that he had made a false move which bade fair to lose him his prey entirely only by elaborate diplomacy would he ever be able to re-establish a footing of friendship weeks must elapse now before he would gain the advantage of another kiss from her lips he swore beneath his breath i didn't mean nothing he said in a surly voice i don't see who has got any call to make such a fuss oh don't you don't you she felt as if she must choke if she continued to parley with him well i do she flashed and turning ran up the fourth flight of steps he swung on his heel muttering and she heard him slam the door to his flat she continued more slowly panting and struggling to subdue the signs of her emotion but she was poisoned to the deeps of her being with her reawakened loathing of man on the top landing she paused blinking back her tears digging her nails into her palms while she fought down a tendency to sob then drew herself up took a deep breath and advancing to the dining room turned the knob with stealth to avoid disturbing her family to her surprise and dismay as the first crack widened between the door and jam she saw that the room was lighted wondering she walked boldly in her father was seated at the dining table a cheap pipe gripped between his teeth contrary to his custom when he sat up late he was not thumbing his dope his fat hairy arms were folded upon the oilcloth his face turned squarely to the door instinctively joan understood that he had waited up for her that inexplicably a crisis was about to occur in her relations with her family in a chair tilted back against the wall near the window opening upon the air shaft butch sat his feet drawn up on the lower rung purple loud thread socks luridly displayed hands in his trouser pockets a cigarette drooping from his cynical mouth a straw hat with brilliant ribbon tilted forward over his eyes closing the door joan put her back to it eyes questioning her parent butch did not move 
thursby sagged his chin lower on his chest where have you been he demanded in deep accents with the incisive and precise enunciation which he had learned to associate only with his faces of bad temper where have i been she repeated stammering where why out walking street walking he suggested with an ugly snarl she sank a limp frightened figure into a chair near the door why pa what do you mean i mean i'm going to find out the why and wherefore of the way you're behaving yourself you're my daughter and not of age yet and i have a right to know what you do and where you go keep still he snapped as she started to interrupt speak when you're spoken to i'm going to have a serious talk with you young woman what's all this i hear about you are losing your job and going on the stage End of chapter three chapter four of joan thursday by lewis joseph vance this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard for a brief moment joan sat agape meeting incredulously the keen contemptuous gaze of her father then she pulled herself together with determination to be neither browbeaten nor overborne where'd you hear that about me she demanded ominously thursby shook his ponderous head it makes no difference it makes a lot of difference to me she cut in sharply contentious you might as well tell me because i won't talk to you if you don't butch brushed the brim of his hat an inch above his eyes and threw her a glance of approbation thursday hesitated his large mottled face sullen and dark in the bluish illumination provided by the single gas jet wheezing above the table then reluctantly he gave in old dennis was in the store this evening he said never mind what he said i guess i know gus has been shooting off her face about me at home and of course old ennis hadn't nothing better to do than to run off and tell you everything he knew then you don't deny it thursby insisted i don't have to it's true no i don't deny it she returned aping his manner to exasperation how would you come to lose your job mr winter insulted me one of the floor walkers if you've got to know thursby's head wagged heavily while he weighed this information and he regarded his daughter with a baleful morose glare his fat hands trembling what did you say to this man winter he asked presently told him i'd slap his face if he tried anything like that on me again so he reported me up to the management lied about me and i got fired there was a long silence through which thursby pondered the matter his thick lips moving inaudibly while joan sat upright maintaining her attitude of independence and defiance and butch grinning lazily as if at some private jest manufactured ring after ring of smoke in the still close air before her father spoke again joan became cognizant of edna and her mother like twin ghosts in their night dresses stealing silently barefooted to listen just within the door of the adjoining bedroom and what do you propose to do now asked thursby at length lifting his weary haunted gaze to his daughter's face what's this about your going on the stage joan set her jaw firmly that's what i'm going to do thursby shook his head with decision i won't have it he said oh you won't well i'd like to know how you're going to stop me i'm tired slaving behind a counter for a dog's wages and that eaten up by fines because i won't go out with the floor walkers i'm going to do the best i can for myself i'm going to be an actress so as i can make a decent living for edna and ma and myself a decent living thursby mocked without mirth you're old enough to know better than that i'm old enough to know which side my bread's buttered on the girl flashed back angrily i'm through living in this dirty flat and giving up every daughter i make to keep us all from starving god knows what we'd do if it wasn't for me with a steady job and edna working during the season you don't do anything to help us out all you get goes on the ponies 
i don't see any reason why i've got to consult you if i choose to better myself she rose the better to end her tirade with a stamp of her foot thursby likewise got up if more sluggishly and moved round the table to confront her you don't go on the stage no he said that's settled understand oh i get you she replied with a flirt of her head but i don't agree with you i'm going down town first thing to-morrow to try for a job with with she hesitated Ziegfeld's follies you will do nothing of the sort he insisted fiercely congested veins starting out upon his forehead you're my daughter and those are my orders to you and you'll obey em or i'll know the reason why you he faltered as if choking then he flung out an arm with a violent gesture indicating the shrinking woman in the doorway you your mother was an actress when i married her and took her off the stage she she don't you dare say a word against my mother joan screamed passionately into his luring face don't you dare you hear me don't you dare her infuriated accents were echoed by a smothered gasp and a spasm of sobbing from the other room momentarily abashed by the sheer force of this defiance the father fell back a pace an expression of almost ludicrous disconcertion shattered his discoloured features then slowly as if thoughtfully he lifted one hand and deliberately tore his collar from its fastening and cast it from him at this hastily jerking his cigarette into the air-shaft butch got up removed his hat and carefully placed it on the mantel out of harm's way you said thursby with apparent difficulty breathing heavily between his words you shan't use that tone to me young woman and live in this house more than that you'll leave it this very night now unless you promise to give up this fool's notion of the stage to-night joan paled her lips tightened but the glint in her eyes wasn't one of fright to-night her father reiterated with malicious pleasure in what he thought to be evidences of consternation and what's more you're going to apologize to me now apologize to you joan caught her breath sharply and her next words came without premeditation she was barely conscious in a rage that she employed them i'll be damned if i do with an inarticulate cry maddened beyond reason thursby lifted a heavy hand and stepped toward her simultaneously butch sprang forward seized the menacing fist and dragged it down and back with a movement so swift and deft that his purpose was accomplished and the hand pinned to the small of thursby's back actually before he appreciated what was happening even joan was slow to comprehend the fact of this amazing intervention nodding emphatically beat it kid butch counselled in a pleasant unstrained tone beat it while the goin's good easy now governor speechless joan slipped out into the hall and slammed the door stumbling blindly in the murk she was none the less quick to find the head of the stairway on the ground floor panting and sobbing she paused to listen there came from above no sound of pursuit to speed her on get on she went out of the house to scurry away through the midnight hush of the squalid street like a hunted thing there was no sort of coherence in her thoughts nothing but shreds and tatters of rage fear and despair all clouded with a faint and vain regret she gave no heed to the way she went impulse controlled and blind instinct guided her but at the corner of park avenue she was obliged to pause for breath and took advantage of that pause to review her plight and plan her future her first concern must be to find a lodging for the night to-morrow could take care of itself uttering a low cry of dismay the girl clutched at the handbag swinging by its strap from her wrist its latch was broken its wide jaws yawned in a breath she had grasped the empty substance of her most dire apprehensions the slender fold of bills handed her when she left the store for the last time that evening was gone whether some sneak thief had robbed her on a surface car or in the broadway rabble or whether the lock had been broken releasing its poor treasure during her struggle with austin on the stairs 
or afterwards or before she could not guess but she was swift to recognize in its bitter fullness the heart-rending futility of retracing her steps to search for the vanished money even though it was all that had stood between her and the world between a common room with food for a week or two and starvation and the streets it was a fact established and irrefutable in her understanding that she could never go back diligently exploring the bag she brought to light a scanty store of small change three quarters a nickel seven coppers eighty-seven cents wherewith to face the world further rummaging it used a handful of odds and ends from which by the light of a corner lamp she presently succeeded in sorting out a folded scrap of paper bearing a pencilled memorandum faint almost to illegibility so that only with some difficulty could joan decipher its legend maisie dean lizzie fogarty two eighty nine west forty fifth street slowly conning the address with mute moving lips until she had it by heart the girl trudged on to madison avenue and there signalled and boarded a southbound surface car it carried few passengers she had a long seat all to herself and about fifteen minutes wherein to debate ways and means she reckoned it several years since lizzie fogarty predecessor of faithless gussie ennis both at the stocking counter and in joan's confidence suddenly and with no warning or explanation had left the department store and for fully eight months thereafter had kept her whereabouts a mystery to her erstwhile associates though rumours were not lacking in support of a shrewd suspicion that she had gone on the stage the truth only transpired when one day she drifted languidly up to the counter behind which she had once served haughtily inspected and selected from goods offered her by a stupefied and indignant gussie and promptly broke down confessing the truth amid giggles not guiltless of a suspicion of tears lizzie was in vaudeville partner in a sister act with monsieur card the dancing deans maisie and may beyond shadow of doubt she had prospered not only was she amazingly and awfully arrayed but there was in evidence an accomplishment believed to be singular to people of great wealth an english accent or what joan and gussie ingeniously accepted as such as practised by miss maisie dean this embellishment consisted merely in broadening every a in the language when she didn't forget and speaking rapidly in a high strained voice its effect upon her former associates was to render the wake she ploughed through their ranks phosphorescent with envy departing in good time to spare the girls the censure of the floor-walker she had left with joan the pencilled address in this council if ever you dream of going into the business my dear don't do anything before you see me that address will always make me no matter where i'm working and i'd do anything in the world for you i know you'd make good anywheres with that shape and them eyes of such stuff as this had joan fashioned her dreams confident in the generosity of lizzie fogarty she relied implicitly upon the willingness of miss maisie dean to help her into the magic circle of the profession she had no more doubt that maisie would make it her business even at cost of personal inconvenience to secure her an engagement than she had that to-morrow's sun would rise upon a world tenanted by one joan thursby or if such doubt entered her mind by stealth she fought it down and cast it forth with all the power of her will for in miss dean nee fogarty now resided her sole immediate hope of friendly aid and advice alighting at forty-fifth street joan hastened westward past fifth avenue and sixth to longacre square here on the corner she paused to don her coat for the low swinging draperies of the painted skies had begun to distill upon the city a gentle drizzle soft and warm only two hours ago a vortex of vivid animation the square now presented a singular aspect of sleepy emptiness with its high glittering walls of steel and glass its polished black paving like moire silk its blushing canopy of cloud its air filled with an infinity of globular atoms of moisture 
swirling and weltering in a shimmer of incandescence it was like a pool of limpid light deep and still few moving things were visible now and again a taxicab infrequently a surface car here and there singly a few prowling women a scattering of predacious men of these latter one who had been skulking beneath the shelter of the new york theatre fire escapes strolled idly out toward joan and addressed her in a whisper of loathly intimacy fortunately she did not hear what he said even as he spoke she slipped away from the curb and like a haunted shadow darted across the open space and into the kindly obscurity of the side street number two eighty nine reared its five-story brownstone front on the northern side of the street hard upon eighth avenue joan inspected it doubtfully its three lower tiers of windows were all dark and lightless but on the fourth floor a single oblong shone with gaslight while on the fifth as many as three were dully aglow the outer doors at the top of the high old-style stoop were closed and even the most hopeful vision could detect no definite illumination through the fanlight into the heart of joan a wretched apprehension stole and there abode cold and crawling from something in the sedate aspect of the house she garnered grim and terrible forebodings nevertheless she dared not lose grasp on hope mounting the stoop she sought the bell pole and found it just below a small strip of paper glued to the stone frayed and weather-beaten it published in letters in faded ink scrawled by an infirm hand the information rooms to let furnished for some reason which she did not stop to analyze this announcement spelled encouragement to joan she wrought lustily at the bell it evoked no sound that she could hear trembling with expectancy she waited several minutes then pulled again and once more waited while the cold of dread spread from her heart to chill and benumb her hands and feet she heard never a sound it was no use she knew it yet she rang again and again frantically with determination and despair and once she vainly tried the door the drizzle had developed into a fine driving rain that swept a slant upon the wings of a new-sprung breeze a great weight seemed to be crushing her a vast invisible hand relentlessly bearing her down to the earth only vaguely did she recognize in this the symptoms of immense physical fatigue added to those of intense emotional strain she only knew that she was all aweary for her bed of a sudden hope and courage both deserted her tears filled her eyes she was so lonely and forlorn so helpless and so friendless huddled in the shallow recess of the doorway she fought her emotion silently for a time then broke down altogether and sobbed without restraint into her handkerchief moments passed uncounted despair possessing her utterly the street was all but empty for some time none remarked the disconsolate girl then a man with a handbag but without an umbrella appeared from the direction of longacre square walking with a deliberation which suggested that he was either indifferent to or unconscious of the rain turning up the steps of number two eighty nine he jingled absently a bunch of keys not until he had reached the platform of the stoop did he notice the woman in the doorway promptly he halted lifting his brows and pursing his lips in a noiseless whistle his head cocked critically to one side then through the warning tempest of her grief joan heard his voice i say what's the matter gulping down a sob and dabbing hastily at her eyes with a sodden wad of handkerchief she caught through a veil of tears a blurred impression of her interrogator a man she ceased instantly to cry and shrank hastily out of his way into the full swing of wind and rain she said nothing but eyed him with furtive distrust he made no offer to move see here he expostulated you're in trouble anything i can do joan felt that she was regaining control of herself she dared to linger and hope rather than to yield to her primitive instinct toward flight nothing she said with a catch in her voice only i-i wanted to see miss dean but nobody answered the bell oh he said thoughtfully 
you wanted to see miss dean yes as though he considered this a thoroughly satisfactory explanation but madame duprat never does answer the door after twelve o'clock you know she says people have no right to call on us after midnight there's a lot in that too you know he wagged his head earnestly really he concluded with animation his voice was pleasant his manner sympathetic if something original joan found courage to inquire do you think perhaps she might be in oh she never leaves the house at least i've never seen her leave it i fancy she thinks one of us might move it away if she got out of sight for a minute or so puzzled joan persisted you really think miss dean is in miss dean oh beg pardon i was thinking of madame de prat ah miss dean now i infer you have urgent business with her what yes very the girl insisted eagerly if i could only see her i must see her i'm sure she's in then the man declared in accents of profound conviction possibly asleep but at home oh positively he inserted a key in the lock and pushed the door open if you don't mind coming in out of the weather i'll see joan eyed him doubtfully the light was indifferent a mere glimmer from the corner lamp at eighth avenue but it enabled her to see that he was passably tall and quite slender he wore a panama hat with dark clothing his attitude was more explicitly impersonal than that of any man with whom she had as yet come into contact she could detect in it no least trace either of condescension or of an ingratiating spirit he seemed at once quite self-possessed and indefinitely preoccupied disinterested and quite agreeable to be made use of in short he engaged her tremendously but what more specifically prepossessed her in his favour and what in the end influenced her to repose some slight confidence in the man was a quality with which the girl herself endowed him she chose to be reminded in some intangible elusive fashion of that flower of latter-day chivalry who had once whisked her out of persecution into his taxicab and to her home in point of fact the two were vastly different and joan knew it but at least she argued they were alike in this both were gentlemen rare visitants in her cosmos it was mostly through fatigue and helpless bewilderment however that she at length yielded and consented to precede him into the vestibule here he opened the inner doors ushering joan into a hallway typical of an old order of dwelling now happily obsolescent the floor was of tiles alternately black and white a hideous checkerboard arrangement a huge hat-rack black walnut framing a morbid mirror towered on the one hand on the other rose a high arched doorway closed and there was a vast and gloomy stairway with an upper landing lost in shadows and penetrable to the feeble illumination of the single small tongue of gas flickering in an old-fashioned bronze chandelier listening joan failed to detect in all of the house any sounds other than those made by the young man and herself if you'll be good enough to follow me he led the way to the rear of the hall where in the shadow of the staircase he unlocked a door and disappeared the girl waited on the threshold of a cool and airy chamber apparently occupying the entire rear half of the ground floor at the back long windows stood open to the night the smell of rain was in the room half a minute i'll make a light he moved through the darkness with the assurance of one on old familiar ground in the middle of the room a match spluttered and blazed with a slight plop a gas drop-light with a green shade leapt magically out of the obscurity discovering the silhouette of a tall spare figure bending low to adjust the flame which presently grew strong and even diffusing a warm and steady glow below the green penumbra of its shade the man turned back with his quaint air of deference now if you don't mind sitting down and waiting a minute i'll ask madame duprat about miss ah your friend miss dean maisie dean thank you with this he left the girl and presently she heard his footsteps on the staircase she found a deeply cushioned armchair and subsided into it with a sigh 
the intensity of her weariness was indeed a very serious matter with her her very wits shirked the labour of grappling with the problem of what she should do if maisie dean were not at home wandering incoherently she stared about her the rich subdued glow of the shaded lamp suggested more than it revealed but she was impressed by the generous proportions of the room the drop light itself stood on a long broad table littered with a few books and a great many papers inkstands pens blotters ash-trays pipes all in agreeable disorder beyond this table was one smaller which supported a typewriting machine against the nearer wall stood a luxurious if worn leather-covered couch there were two immense black walnut bookcases the windows at the back disclosed a section of iron-railed balcony joan grew sensitive to an anodynous atmosphere of quiet and comfort drowsily she heard a quiet knocking at some door upstairs then a subdued murmur of voices the closing of a door footsteps returning down the long staircase when these last sounded on the tiled flooring the girl spurred her flagging senses and got up in a sudden flutter of doubt anxiety and embarrassment the man entering the room found her so poised in indecision please do sit down he said quietly with a smile that carried reassurance and taking her compliance for something granted passed on to another armchair near the long table with a docility and total absence of distrust that later surprised her to remember joan sank back eyes eloquent with the question unuttered by her parted lips her host lounging turned to her a face of which one half was in dense shadow a keen strongly modelled face with deep-set eyes at once whimsical and thoughtful and a mouth thin-lipped but generously wide he rested an elbow on the table and his head on a spare sinewy hand thrusting slender fingers up into hair straight not long and rather light in colour i'm sorry to have to report he said gently that the dancing deans maisie and may are on the road so i'm informed by madame duprat at least they're not expected back for several weeks i hope you aren't greatly disappointed her eyes wide and dark with dismay told him too plainly that she was she made no effort to speak but after an instant of dumb consternation moved as if to rise he detained her with a gesture please don't hurry you needn't you know of course if you must i won't detain you the door is open your way clear to the street but what are you going to do about a place to sleep to-night she stared in surprise and puzzled resentment a warm wave of colour temporarily displaced her pallor what makes you so sure i've got no place to sleep she asked ungraciously he lifted his shoulder slightly and dropped his hand to the table perhaps i was impertinent he admitted i'm sorry but you haven't have you no i haven't she said sharply but what's that as you quite reasonably imply it's nothing to me he interrupted suavely but i'd be sorry to think of you out there alone in the rain when there's no reason why you need be no reason she echoed wondering if she had misjudged him after all without warning the man tilted the green lampshade until a broad strong glow flooded her face a spark of indignation kindled in the girl while she endured his brief impersonal silent examination sheer fatigue alone prevented her from rising and walking out of the room that and curiosity he replaced the shade and got out of the chair with a swift movement that seemed not at all one of haste i see no reason he announced coolly i've got to run along now i merely dropped in to get a manuscript i think you'll be quite comfortable here and there's a good bolt on the door of course it's very unconventional but i hope you will be kind enough to overlook that considering the circumstances and to-morrow after a good rest you can make up your mind whether it would be wiser to stick to your first plan or go home he smiled with a vague disinterested geniality and added a pleading now don't say no when he saw that the girl had likewise risen how do you know i've left home she demanded hotly well his smile broadened deductive faculty sherlock holmes dupin that sort of tommy rot you know 
but it wasn't such a bad guess now was it i don't see how you knew she muttered sulkily he ran his long fingers once or twice through his hair in a manner of great perplexity i can't quite tell myself it wasn't my fault she protested with a flash of passion i lost my job to-day and because i said i wanted to go on the stage my father put me out of the house yes he agreed amiably they always do don't they i fancied it was something like that but there isn't really any reason why you shouldn't go home to-morrow and patch it up or is there she gulped convulsively you don't understand probably i don't he conceded still things may look very much otherwise in the morning they generally do i notice one goes to bed with reluctance and wakes up with a headache all that sort of thing but if you'll listen to me a moment why then if you want to go i shan't detain you my name is john matthias my trade is writing things plays mostly i know it sounds foolish but then i hate exercise i live sleep that is uh elsewhere down the street this is merely my workroom so your stopping here won't inconvenience me in the least he snatched up a mass of papers from the table folded them hastily and thrust them into a coat pocket that manuscript i was after good night i do hope you'll be comfortable before the amazed girl could collect herself he had his hat and handbag and was already in the hallway she ran after him but mr matthias he glanced hastily over his shoulder while fumbling with a night latch i can't let you oh but you must really you know he had the door open but why do you how can you trust me with all your things tut he said reprovingly from the vestibule nothing here but play scripts and they're not worth anything you can't get anybody to produce em i know because i tried he closed the inner door and banged the outer behind him joan on the point of pursuing to the street paused in the vestibule and for a moment stood doubting then with a bewildered look she returned slowly to the back room shut herself in and shot the bolt on the platform of the stoop mr matthias delayed long enough to turn up his coat collar for the better protection of his linen and surveyed with a wry grin the slashing rush of rain through which he now must needs paddle unprotected queer thing for a fellow to do he mused dispassionately dare say i'm a bit of an ass i might at least have borrowed my own umbrella but that would hardly have been consistent with the egregious insanity of the performance i wonder why i do these awful things if i only knew perhaps i could reform running down the steps he set out at a rapid pace for the hotel astor which in due time received and harbored him for the night End of chapter four chapter five of john thursday by lewis joseph vance this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard awakening at a late hour in a small bedroom bright with sunlight mr matthias treated himself to a moment of incredulity such surroundings were strange to his drowsy perceptions and his transitory emotions on finding himself so curiously embedded might be most aptly and tersely summed up in the exclamation of the old lady in the nursery rhyme lack a mercy can this be i being however susceptible to a conviction of singular strength that he was himself and none other and by dint of sheer will-power overcoming a tremendous disinclination to do anything but lie still and feel perfectly healthy sound and at peace with the world he induced himself to roll over and fish for his watch in the pocket of the coat hanging on a nearby chair the hour proved to be half past ten he fancied that he must have been uncommonly tired to have slept so late then he remembered one doesn't need to get drunk to be daft was the conclusion he enunciated to his loneliness i hope to goodness she doesn't go poking through my papers the perturbation to which this thought gave rise got him out of bed more promptly than would otherwise have been the case none the less he forgot it entirely in another moment and had bathed and dressed and was 
knotting his tie before a mirror when the memory of the girl again flitted darkly athwart the glass of his consciousness wonder what it was that made me turn myself out of house and home for the sake of that girl anyway something about her but try as he might he could recall no definite details of her personality she remained a shadow a hunted tearful desperate wraith of girlhood more than that nothing he wagged his head seriously something about her must have been good-looking or something with which he drifted off into an inconsequent and irrelevant reverie which entertained him exclusively throughout breakfast and his brief homeward walk in his magnificent patoscopic protean imagination he was busily engaged in writing the first act of a splendid new play something exquisitely odd original witty and dramatic a vague smile touched the corners of his mouth his eyes were hazily lustrous his nose was in the air he had forgotten his guest entirely he ran up the steps of number two eighty nine let himself in trotted down the hall and burst unceremoniously into his room not in the least disconcerted to find it empty not indeed mindful that it might have been otherwise his hat went one way his handbag into a corner with a resounding bang he sat himself down at his typewriter quickly and deftly inserted a sheet of paper into the carriage and sat back at leisure his gaze wandering dreamily out of the long open windows into the world of sunshine that shimmered over the back yards a subconscious impulse moved him to stretch forth a long arm and drop his hand on the centre table after a few seconds his groping fingers closed round the bowl of an aged and well-beloved pipe he filled it lighted it smoked serenely half an hour elapsed before he was disturbed then someone knocked imperatively on the door he recognized the knock it was madame de Prats. swinging round in his chair he said pleasantly come in madame de Prat entered filling the doorway she shut the door and stood in front of it subjecting it to an almost total eclipse she was tall and portly a grenadier of a woman with a countenance the austerity of whose severely classic mould was somewhat moderated by a delicate dark little moustache on her upper lip her man was regal and portentous sitting well upon the person of the widow of a great if unrecognised french tragedian but her eyes were kindly and matthias had long since decided that it needed a body as big as madame de Prat's to contain her heart bonjour monsieur bonjour madame this form of salutation was invariable between them but the french of matthias rarely withstood much additional strain he lapsed now into english cocking an eye alight with whimsical intelligence at the face of the landlady madame possessed the gift as it were an inheritance from the estate of her late husband of creating an atmosphere at will when and where she would that which her demeanour now created within the four walls of the chamber of monsieur matthias was rather electrical something's happened to disturb madame he hazarded what's the row have we discharged our chef is it that the third floor front is behind hand with his rent or has achilles that dachshund of heaven turned suffragette and proved it with puffs the row monsieur madame checked him coldly has to do only with the conduct of monsieur himself eh matthias queried blankly you ask me what the hands of madame were vivid with exasperation is it that monsieur is not aware he entertained a young woman in this room last night oh that the cloud passed from monsieur's eyes he smiled cheerfully but it was quite proper indeed madame believe me i proper and what is propriety to me if you please at my age madame demanded indignantly am i not aware that monsieur left my house almost immediately after entering it and spent the night elsewhere did i not from my window see him running up the street with his handbag through the rain but am i to figure as the custodian of my lodger's morals the thought perished annihilated by an ample gesture my quarrel with monsieur is that he left the young woman here alone matthias found the vernacular the only adequate vehicle of expression i've got to hand it to you madame de Prat, 
your point of view is essentially gallic but what is the explanation of this conduct monsieur am i to look forward to future escapades of the same nature do you intend to make my house a refuge for all the stray unfortunates of new york am i and my guest to be left to the mercies of god knows who simply because monsieur has a heart of pity oh here matthias broke in with some impatience it wasn't as bad as that it's not likely to happen again and besides the girl was a perfectly good nice respectable girl madame should know that i wouldn't take any chances with people i didn't know all about monsieur knew the young woman then oh yes assuredly yes matthias lied nonchalantly by the happiest of accidents his glance searching the table for a box of matches wherewith to relight his pipe encountered a sheet of typewriter paper on which a brief message had been scrawled in a formless untrained hand dear sir he read with relief thank you your friend joan thursby he found the matches and used one before looking up miss thursby he said coolly is the daughter of an eminently respectable family in reduced circumstances thinking to better her condition she proposed to become an actress but met with such violent opposition on the part of her father a bigot of a man that she was obliged to leave her home in order to retain her self-respect quite naturally she thought first of her only friend in the profession miss maisie dean and came here to find her the rest you may imagine was i to turn her out to wander through the rain at two o'clock in the morning madame discredits her heart by suggesting anything of the sort madame's expression of contrition seemed to endorse this reproof she hesitated with a hand on the doorknob monsieur is prepared to vouch for the young woman certainly he assented with an imperturbable countenance masking a creepy crawly feeling that perhaps he might be letting himself in for more than he bargained very good i go with apologies madame opened the door thursday you said he repeated without bothering to correct her joan thursday barbara's names of these mad americans the door closing totally eclipsed the grenadier with thoughtful deliberation matthias smiling guiltily tore joan's note into minute bits and dropping them in a wastebasket dismissed her message and herself entirely from his mind five minutes later the typewriter was rattling cheerily but its staccato chattering continued without serious interruption only for the time required to cover two pages and part of a third then came a long interval of smoke soothed meditation which ended with the young man cheerfully placing fresh paper in the machine and starting all over again this time he worked more slowly weighing carefully the value of lines already written before recasting and committing them to paper but the third sheet was covered without evident error and a fourth and then a fifth indeed the type bars were drumming heartily on the last quarter of page six when suddenly the young man paused scowled thrust back his chair and groaned from his heart he sat for a space teetering on the rear legs of his chair his lips pursed forehead deeply creased from temple to temple then in a sepulchral tone uttering the single word snagged he rose and began to pace slowly to and fro between the door and the windows at the end of an hour he was still patrolling this well-worn beat his way of torment by day and by night if the threadbare length of the carpet were to be taken as a reliable witness and there's no telling how long he might have continued the exercise had not madame duprat knocked once again at his door roused by that sound he came suddenly out of profound speculations stopping short and bidding madame enter he waited with hands thrust deep in his trouser pockets and shoulders hunched high toward his ears a cloud of annoyance darkening his countenance madame de prat came in with a pardon monsieur and a yellow envelope placing this last upon the table she announced with simple dignity a telegram if you please and retired matthias strode to the table and with an air of some surprise and excitement tore open the message he found its import unusual in more than one respect it was not a day letter and it had been written with a fine careless extravagance of emotion that wrecked naught whatever of the ten-word limit he conned its opening aloud beast animal coward ingrate poltroon traitor beast 
at this point he broke off to glance at the signature and observed thoughtfully if helen is going in for this sort of thing i really must buy her a thesaurus she's used beast twice in two lines he continued how dared you run away last night you promised i was counting on you i am disgusted with you and never want to see your face again return at once perhaps you won't be too late after all imperative i insist that you return the signature was simply helena he said with considerable animation but damn it i don't want to get married yet i don't see what i've done throwing back his shoulders and lifting a defiant chin he announced with invincible determination i won't go that's all there is about it i will not go besides he argued plaintively i couldn't travel like this clothes all out of shape from that drenching last night no time to change consultation of his watch gave flat contradiction to his assertion and besides i'm just getting this thing started nicely this with reference to the play with another groan even more soulful than the first he sat down at the table seized the telephone in a savage grasp and in prematurely embittered accents detailed a suburban number to the inoffensive central operator in the inevitable three minutes wait for the connection to be put through he found ample opportunity to lash himself to a frenzy of exasperation hello he roared suddenly hello i say who is this oh you a eh, swinton this is mr matthias no i say no don't call mrs tankerville I haven't time just tell her i'm coming down on the six thirty yes and send something to meet me at the station yes good-bye chapter five